very kind to accept our invitation and participate uh, uh, virtually. Uh, I don't think that he's someone that needs introduction for this audience. You all know who he is and, and uh, how important he is to the uh, this area, uh, the study, the studies of uh, science fiction. Uh, the way we'll proceed is we'll give him the word first, and he would like to make some comments as he has read all of your uh, papers and abstracts for those of you that send them in advance. Uh, so he, he'll be commenting on those. Uh, because of uh, uh, personal uh, situation he has at home, he may need to step out uh, uh, for three, four minutes uh, now and then, so, so we'll just bear with him. Uh, five to ten minutes, I would say. Okay, for five to ten minutes. Uh, so if he needs to do that, we'll just carry on with the discussion and wait for him uh, to, to join back. So after we have the pleasure of hearing uh, uh, from him first, then we can start the discussion. And I want to make sure that we also have enough time at the end to discuss also some organizational issues. Uh, in particular uh, for Steps Forward and the event next year. And there will be a bus waiting for you at 6 o'clock. Uh, uh, it should be over here, but I'll clarify this uh, in between. At the parking lot behind the building at 6 o'clock. 5.30, okay. Uh, so if any of you need to collect any uh, luggage before that, or if you have it with you, uh, just make sure you plan and you're all there ready for 5.30. I know we haven't been keeping time uh, uh, very strictly over the past few days because discussions have been so exciting, but this time we need to keep. <laughs> so the departure, is, the bus is going. <laughs> okay. uh, with no further ado, I will give uh, now the floor to Professor Subin. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy and honored to be present in this weird, disembodied way, but better than nothing, I guess. And I'm sorry I couldn't come. I really, uh, you, you really ticked all my boxes, uh, science fiction and communism, but it just couldn't be. Um, let me say only a few words because you all have seen what is my basic thesis about communism. Um, I started the writing about this as different from Marxism, okay, but uh, about 10-15 years ago it was a collateral damage, as the American Army says, to my writing my memoirs, which I published a part of and then I stopped uh, because I have a writer's book. Uh, in a Zagreb periodical called Gorzokan, and writing those memoirs about the years 1945 to 55, more or less, um, I began to ask myself, how come that something which, to my mind, I'm persuaded, had started so well, in Yugoslavia at least, uh, finished so badly in the worst possible variant? Um, uh, how how come we thought what we thought? In other words, uh, I began to get busy with um, epistemology. Um, and I wrote a, a lot to those interested can see it on my blog, I'm sure, http darkosuvin.com. Um, so, I have read uh, the resumes or abstracts of your papers. I'm sorry I couldn't hear them, but no, I just couldn't. One thing I have to say is that I learned many new things. Uh, I learned that Hegedish wrote the novel. I, I know, I wrote about Hegedish in my book on Yugoslav. I know who he is, I know what he did. I know his works, uh, non-fictional works. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about the novel by Kosir in Belgrade. I didn't know that Korman ca cannibalized Soviet, early Soviet science fiction movies. I didn't know about Liang Huanghua, uh, the Maoist, um, whatever, comic strips <laughs> or whatever you would call them. Um, so that is a very good thing. I, I think what uh, our 
Godoy and Gerard colleagues did is a very proper thing. The Latins called it de nobis non sine nobis, not about us without us. Okay, so if we want to talk, uh, I think that for most of you, which I don't share, but quite logically and, and understandably, communism means uh, the rule of the so-called communist parties in Eastern Europe. Okay, so if we have to talk about Eastern Europe, let Eastern Europe be present and tell us. After all, they know more. They live through it, which carries some biases, okay, which has to be discussed, uh, as all lived experiences, right? Uh, but without which we cannot understand anything. I think this, uh, um, I, am, I am in that sense very much uh, under the influence of Edward Said. We should, we should not impose uh, not only our prejudices, but our interests on others. And he rightly called it Orientalism. In, in that sense, there is also European Orientalism. Uh, you know what Balkanizing means. I mean, a Bulgarian lady wrote a very good book about this. Okay. Um, so, first of all, I learned a lot. Uh, Miss Stone, in her paper, is quite right uh, as far as the biographic background of where I come from is concerned. It is a kind of, a, how should I say, bridge, shifting, intercourse, dialogue between uh, the Yugoslavia of my youth and uh, the new left, the West, the developed capitalism, and so on. And this is, of course, the same as Bloch, uh, except that Bloch is the generation, and Bloch is the generation of my father. So he reacted to uh, 1917, uh, and then the early Soviet Union, and then Hitler. I reacted to the 1941-45 anti-fascist war and, and developed fascism. You know, that, that, there is a difference there. Um, so, so this is a curious position because, uh, on the one hand, I more or less had to leave Zagreb because they kicked me out. Uh, but and now this great, they say Croatian, which is of course true only bureaucratically, um, uh, scientist, uh, international, blah, 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 blah. Um, and uh, this is can, can I tell you an anecdote? Yes. Yes? Yes, please. Um, in 48, um, we were having maturity exams and festivities in Zagreb. Uh, and the tradition there was a bourgeois democratic tradition that you go around the shops and collect voluntary contributions in money to finance the festivities. So, uh, two of us went in the center of Zagreb to a textile shop, and the young and very sharp um, director of the shop, or whatever you call it, manager, he was probably a partisan lieutenant or sergeant, you know, these were all nationalized shops, said to us, aha, I know, you want American socialism. And we laughed a bit uncomfortably and said, yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> So that is uh, what uh, my generation more or less tried to do. Let us take the, how should I say, the forms of thought and behavior developed in more affluent post-bourgeois revolution uh, countries and apply it in our way. Okay, in other words, let's de-dogmatize Marxism, let's do this and that. So I cannot say much more about communism because I've written so much, I could take three hours of it. I will just say one more thing. In one of my essays, I try to differentiate putting aside Plato and more and, you know, a million plebeian writers. I try to differentiate between, as I say, one has to unpack 
this notion. I have three main meanings of it. One is the communism of Marx, one is the communism of Stalin, and one is the communism of um, the best anarchists, okay, the so-called anarcho-communists. Uh, my preference is halfway between the anarchists and Marx, where I think Lenin was uh, for most of his life, except the last three or four years when he had to be ruthless. And of course, this is diametrically opposed to the dominant features of Stalinism, uh, which were in good part, perhaps in decisive part, introduced into the rest of Eastern Europe. Uh, Yugoslavia, fortunately, got rid of that in part, not wholly, uh, in 48. Okay, now, a few words about, about science fiction. Um, first of all, uh, when I was young, I did a lot of logic and semantics, and this is like, like, like uh, scratching, it never leaves you. Uh, in order to talk about anything, you must define a unit. What is a unit? It is something that has limits. Okay? A semantic unit has a nucleus called the notation and fringe elements that come and go, the connotations. It's like the old, the old atom model, right? The nucleus and the little electrons outside. Um, if we don't do this, we can talk about anything in any way, and it will never be conclusive if there isn't some kind of more or less clear agreement what we are talking about. Um, so, then we have to, and, and I proposed some elements of determining this unit, right? Cognitive estrangement, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the same holds for utopia, and there I think one has to differentiate very clearly between the horizons, uh, say the utopian horizons, the dystopian, anti-utopian, whatever you want, and uh, the utopian diegetics or plotting. You can have utopian horizons anywhere. Some of your papers made a lot of good mileage with that. Okay, in, in Bloch wrote a book of 2,000 pages uh, calling it the principle of hope. Uh, where there's a lot of music, one of his main examples is uh, Don Giovanni by, by Mozart, uh, etc. Um, that is fine at the beginnings, but then if everything is a utopia, then nothing is a utopia, right? This is logic. Uh, however, at any rate, you cannot say that uh, utopian horizons have to be accompanied by utopian plotting. Sometimes they are, sometimes they are not. For example, my old acquaintance, Professor Goshilo, uh, speaks about the Alexander of 1930s musical called Kostya the Shepherd or Johnny Fellows or whatever it was called like. It has maybe a utopian horizon. I would actually call it more Arcadian or pastoral. But it definitely doesn't have utopian diegetics or plotting. The plotting is uh, a love story, whatever, okay? Uh, does that mean that you cannot talk at a conference about utopia or science fiction about it? Of course not. You can talk about anything you wish, especially when you are beginning to map the land as you are for Eastern Europe. You know, maybe later you make a more specialized conference, you say only this kind of stuff will be allowed, but now that's perfectly okay. Um, so what I would say is that science fiction provides, as I read in one of the uh, papers, a field where utopian and dystopian of the utopianism or dystopianism of the regime were debated and conceptualized. And I would add intention 
not so much with capitalism, uh, which was much ignored and much undervalued in all socialism, including Titoism and, and most theoreticians, but in tension with what I call C2, with Stalinism, right? Uh, capitalism was simply because it because it was in was in, in its welfare state phase, and there were many theories that it's going to converge uh, with the Soviet bloc and so on. Uh, people like Lem or the Strugatskis have a horror of consumerism, uh, consumer society, second only to their horror at the police state. I think uh, possibly as big. So it, it depends, but we have to know what we are talking about. That's simply what, what I'm trying to say. Then secondly, uh, we have to use some tools to understand it. I remember in the 70s, 80s, a student said to me, a graduate student, what do I take for my PhD? Uh, I want to take uh, a master of thinking, and something out of science fiction. How about Lacan and cyberpunk? And I said, really? Um, why not Derrida and outer space? Uh, you know, uh, it was simply a passion. You have to use Lacan. You have to use Derrida. You have to use seven other people. Um, who will be forgotten, buried or not, I think, uh, in about 30 years. Uh, in the Cold War era, you have to use totalitarianism, which I think is a totally fake category, though I must say I have, I have a fable for Hannah Arendt's definition, which is very sophisticated, non-Cold War version. Uh, but totalitarianism means simply Whoever has a political system that's different from liberal parliamentary capitalism is bad. Whatever that system might be, we don't differentiate further. Okay. Um, now, how do you explain that the most horrible blood, uh, how should I call them, the most horrible profusion of blood was between Russian so-called communists and German fascists? Uh, in other words, this this uh, this category, I think, is is insufficient. Uh, of course, you can add other things to it. One of my favorite things out of Lenin's reading of of Hegel is his not saying, "Ah, oh, well, you have here an idealist, not a materialist critic," but he's an intelligent critic. In other words, he's using Lenin is using two categories. Uh, good and bad ideologically, intelligent versus stupid. Okay, well, that's already a bit more sophisticated. You see what I mean? We need several categories. Um, so, you know, for example, one can say Bulgakov's, Bulgakov certainly knew about science fiction. After all, he wrote Heart of a Dog, okay, which is clearly science fiction. Uh, but Master Margarita may have, it's a, there's a very sophisticated argument about it in, in one of your papers, it's a kind of very mixed thing, an olla podrida, as the Spanish would say. And it may have some science fiction elements, but it is in no ways really dominant. In other words, we have to introduce the category of a narrative dominant, which work is narratively dominant, science fiction in a narratively dominant sense. Um, I don't think you can say this for Master and Margarita. I do think you can say this for Heart of a Dog. Does Heart of a Dog have other elements of course it does? Uh, all our categories are, are models which are more or less perfectly realized or, or not realized. So, um, is, in other words, ideology more important than literary genre? If you talk about horizons, you're talking about ideology, all right? Uh, where are we going to? Which horizons are we going towards? 
Um, in, I think in Master and Margarita, the, the horizons, the ideology is more important than the literary genre. He used, uh, rightly, it was said in that paper, he used all that came to his hand. He was also in a very difficult situation, half ostracized and so on, you know that. Uh, and the, the same could be said about China Mieville, who is certainly the best writer of so-called fantasy today, okay? And, and first of all, uh, uh, an avowed extremist left-winger. Um, what is that? What is that when in his first uh, big novel, uh, the Perdido Street Station, it, behind everything that in the underground, there is the devil. Okay, so devil has all uh, the main plot elements in hand. Uh, well, it's an olla podrida, and you have to decide whether the literary genre is more important than the ideology. Uh, I think both are, both are important because the literary genre gives you um, a certain scope. You can go that far. In science fiction, you can go much further than you can in fantasy. In my, to my mind, that I've argued this at, at length and so on. So I think this is enough for the beginning, and let us go on and you please object, ask, whatever. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Suvin. Uh, we'll proceed with, this, uh, with the discussion. I would like to just ask that you always use the mic uh, so that our people who are watching uh, live uh, can actually hear you, and also for the taping that we'll send afterwards. It, it would be nice if people said their names. Uh, so me, yes, this is Emilia nice Zankina talking, uh, but I was just uh, sort of setting the stage. So yes, please introduce yourself as you uh, pick up the mic. Um, uh, hello, so this is Katie Stone. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, for your words. Um, I was I was so interested. Um, uh, obviously, um, as you know, my, my paper was about um, a relationship between uh, Bloch's utopian theory and and your uh, criticism. And I I thought that's such a good point about um, you being from different generations, essentially, and like the differences in your experience because of that. And uh, so I was just wondering um, if everyone doesn't mind if you could elaborate a little bit on on what you think. Um, a, an effect of that difference might be, um, if that's okay. That's Miss Stone, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay. Um, well, Bloch was part of this huge Weimar Republic movement. Let me just mention two giants, which are, for me, as important as he is and eventually became perhaps more important than that is Bertolt Brecht and Walter Benjamin. Um, the best, certainly, dramatist of the century and the best critic of the century, and probably one of the best poets of the century, Brecht. Um, they had this messianic utopian Leninism, okay? Uh, impulse, which was very powerful. Uh, then they had to cope with fascism. As Gramsci wrote somewhere, after fascism, we cannot use the category of progress anymore. And Benjamin, of course, wrote this at much greater length. He wasn't in prison, as, as Gramsci was. Um, so that is... Uh, they, then, um, most of them, characteristically, <laughs> it's very interesting, who survived, um, Benjamin didn't survive, um, uh, most of them went to the USA, not to the Soviet Union. Brecht actually was extremely clever. He went through the Soviet Union to Vladivostok on a ship to Manila and then to California. That's extremely clever. That's, that's typically Brechtian. Um, and uh, then 
which is also because of that powerful first impulse and then the powerful second counter impulse of Hitlerian fascism, Nazism, they came back to East Germany. Well, that as we, where they ran into all kinds of troubles and so on and so on. But that is an experience totally different, not totally, but let's say semi-different from mine. I was a little boy whom the fascists wanted to kill and didn't quite manage because I had a very clever mother. Uh, how do you react to this? How do you how do you digest this? Well, obviously you become an anti-fascist. This is my guiding light in my life, so to speak. What does this mean? Who is consistently always anti-fascist? Well, obviously Marxism. Etc. Etc. You, you you see what I mean. The differences are uh, the differences are generational differences. But then I could I could uh, have the advantage of adopting Ernst Bloch uh, in the 1950s already uh, as as a kind of uh, guru, as a kind of master of thinking. Yeah, thank you very much. That's it's a very big question, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, hi, again, Professor Sugan. This is Radica Konstantinova. I want to jump in the topic and ask you uh, because we are trying to understand what is special, what is what is special about the interaction between the genre with its method of cognitive estrangement, as you coined it. But uh, just a bit more slowly. So, what is sorry, special? I speak very fast. No. <laughs> so I mean, uh, I mean this: uh, the concept of cognitive estrangement, as if you have, as you have coined, how this applies to a situation in which reality is already alerted. It's already estranged in a way that there is a different life in the home, in the private life, and in the public life. So when you have already a level of distance, I, I didn't understand this. I'm sorry. I'm saying that during communism, we all know here having lived at this time, uh, there was a double life, one of political correctness outside of the personal domain and one private, which might be different and there might be discrepancies between the two, very often there were. So how in terms of science fiction, the method of cognitive, the device of cognitive estrangement, how it works in a situation in life which is already estranged in a way, there's already like a double alertation of the situation. You, you are speaking too quickly. I just cannot follow you. I'm very sorry, Ravitsa. Just slow it down. Like like for a brain damaged child. Emilia Karabova will repeat the question quietly. Okay, let me... You are speaking about science fiction in Bulgaria. This much I understood, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> let me try to translate. Do you, do you hear me well? This is Emilia yeah. Zankina. Uh, so in communism, you have a division between public and private life. So you have private life that is very different from the public politically correct life. And how does the concept of cognitive estrangement uh, that you uh, coined uh, tackle this already existing division uh, within a society. Mm -hmm. now, now I got it. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry about this. Uh, well, my impulse is to say know-how. Um, how does it tackle know-how? Because it's not coined for uh, pragmatic situations, but for a literary genre. Um, on the other hand, obviously, literary genres don't arise in vacuum. They arise in very dense uh, socio-psychological space-time, okay? Zones, if you wish to speak the language of some people at your conference. Um, so it's, it's a fair question. I'm, I'm not sure what to answer. Uh, the separation of public and private life is, of course, not not specific to Stalinist communism or any other. It is very well developed in capitalism, okay? 
Um, it is just that uh, the state apparatus is much heavier uh, in some forms than in other forms. You know, for example, it was much heavier in the Soviet Union than in Yugoslavia. It was much heavier in Keynesian welfare state than in 19th century capitalism or today capitalism. Today's capitalism has international heavy apparatuses, you know, the International Monetary Fund, Warren Bank, and so on. These are our real rulers. Uh, so, yes, I think it's a fair question, and I don't have a real answer to it. I think Possibly, what you're talking about is what Marx would call some form of alienation, right? Um, it is an all-pervasive situation in almost all our societies. So possibly the real answer would be that you take a concrete situation, let us say Bulgarian science fiction between 1955 and 1975, and you investigate it. And then you see how much can you apply of this and how much you cannot. Uh, I think that cognitive estrangement is a kind of horizon for me. That is to say, it's an ideal. Does everything have to be cognitive? By God, no. You know, you have plot elements which are just fun or necessary or whatever. Um, so the estrangement, I think, functions simply because you are shown something you don't know in order to understand your everyday life. That's the best answer I can give you, really. Just a follow-up uh, question on behalf of Aralitsa. Do you think that we can talk about a double cognitive estrangement in such a situation? Why double? Because the oh, estrangement... It, please, where, where do you come from? So, uh, first, the uh, cognitive estrangement, as you define it, but then the estrangement uh, from the public sphere within socialist societies. Ah, but that is not estrangement, that is alienation. One is called Entfremdung okay. in German, the other is called Verfremdung. Okay? That is, uh, we, we are here in a semantic mind. Thank uh, you. That, that is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Naren. Right, I think I want to contribute a little bit to your topic. Uh, I think in this case, yeah, I think, uh, okay, so my name is Bayar Kinren, and uh, I want to contribute to your uh, to your question. I think a very good example of, uh, relative to your question, will be 1984, of which I spoke, and it will be uh, not double referendum, but I think it will be uh, parallel realities, maybe in zero world, so because the private life and public life will be considered as a parallel realities of the zero world, and from this double zero world we have uh, projection, map it to uh, world one, world two, world it's possible to consider it like that, if it, it would be helpful for you. Okay, thanks. Well, my, my name is uh, Miglana Nikolcina, and I would like to ask you what you think about the most recent utopia which fell apart just a few years ago and which uh, was related to the possibilities of uh, new technologies to bring about um, direct democracy. So that the idea, as you know, was that thanks to, to new communication, um, people would be able to mobilize immediately in response to pressing social and political problems. And of course, this would give the possibility for each one to be immediately included in processes of uh, society and 
and politics. And then very soon it became clear that it is much easier for these uh, new technolo technological means to be manipulated. Well, Erdogan would be one example with Turkey and what happened there. And of course, we can uh, use many examples after this uh, with what's, what's happening in, in politics all, all over the place now. So what, what do we do if uh, things, again, as in all problematic utopias, boil down to to uh, the individual and the, so, so to say, incorrigible uh, subject uh, of all utopias? Um, I didn't get all of it, but I got that you're asking me how can modern technology of communication, etc., be used today for direct democracy? Is that correct? And how actually it cannot, because we've seen examples that it doesn't work. Well, uh, present day capitalism, right or overripe capitalism, is a splendid example, uh, to my mind, of uh, um, uh, what Marx described in different ways. Uh, of the productive relationships hold, uh, holding back the productive forces. The productive forces we have today are enough for everybody on this planet if we stop at 8 billion and don't go on, of course, uh, to live reasonably. Not richly, but reasonably. No hunger, etc., etc. Health, uh, you know. The productive relation, the relationships which have as its base a certain mode of production, but which extend outside production to everything, right, uh, are um, uh, are a break. B r b r a k e. Uh, they first of all, uh, I think, we live in very unhealthy psychologically, very unhealthy societies, especially in the major countries such as the United States, uh, France, England, Russia. Uh, I'm not sure about China, okay, but uh, so that uh, people are full of fear, anxieties, resentment. You see that in all the mass media, in all these Twitters and blah, 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 okay, which is the reason I don't use it. Um, secondly, the political, the, the, how should I say it, the ruling situation is horrible, okay? There is really no possibility. It's, it's very similar to Stalinism, except more clever. It's a kind of iron fist in a velvet glove, right? There is really no possibility of changing anything. The Italians are now uh, wanting to have a minister of uh, economy or industry who has some doubts about Europe. Uh, Europe is not allowing it, it's very simple. The, the stock market will fall and Italy will be in bankruptcy and goodbye. Okay, so there is a very clever way of doing this if the communists have only been so clever as to have a mediation like uh, the stock market, I mean, not in finance, but in something else, they may have survived.
this is quite clear if you read the English 19th century historians. Okay. Um, so, so to be for or against technology seems to me insufficient. You have to say what technology used by whom for which purpose. If it is used for direct democracy, as already you can find, for example, in Mayakovsky's play of 1921, fantastic. Okay, I'm all for it. I'm for direct democracy. I have very little confidence in parliamentary democracy, and certainly none if it's not twinned with direct democracy. Uh, and that's all that one can say at the moment, I think. Perhaps we can uh, take the discussion to the next step. This is Emilia Zantina speaking uh, and talk about uh, the future. So how does this topic relate? How does this topic relate to discourses about the future? Uh, you talk is about the future from where we are now. Are you asking me something? Hello, this is Alexander Popov. Uh, Professor Sugan, you mentioned in the beginning that you have sympathies with anarcho-communism. Anarcho um, and uh, I've read, I think... In, okay, sorry. So um, I said that in the beginning, you mentioned that you have sympathies with anarcho-communism. And... Um, in the introduction to the new edition of Metamorphosis of Science Fiction, I think, you say you describe yourself as a Shintoist cyber Marxist. And I was wondering... I was in Taiwan, you know, I was in Taiwan and they asked me what was my ideology. <laughs> it's uh, very nice. I mean the Academy of Sciences, which means the Taiwan one. Uh, and, you know, Shintoism has 10,000 gods. 10,000 in Japanese, by the way, doesn't mean 10,000. It means a myriad, as many as you can imagine. Okay? Uh, I like that. You can play one god against another, you know, yeah. uh, and so on. So, and the cyber Marxism means that a lot has changed since old Karl died, you know. <laughs> it's really brilliant, but... Uh, he couldn't see the future. He couldn't. He couldn't. He couldn't see fascism. He couldn't see our fantastic technological novelties. Um, to begin with, the car. To go on with the airplane and so on. So you really have to update. In other words, if you think as I do that Marxism is a sturdy tree, you have to. You have to put new branches on it. You have to use. Uh, some good biology with it. Is that an answer for what you wanted to hear or is was there something else you want to well, uh, More or less. I was going to ask if you think that such a post-humanist turn uh, where we uh, allow other non-human beings, maybe AIs, maybe machines, maybe other objects to uh, share their horizons, maybe have a multiplicity of horizons, would that perhaps um, facilitate the salvaging of utopian narratives? And maybe we can see that in some of recent science fiction, for example, Kim Stanley Robinson. Yes. Um, I much like uh, Robin, Stan Robinson in general, not everything, but uh, the, the California trilogy, the Mars trilogy, uh, and then his latest book is, is just brilliant, the New York 2041, you know, uh, with a, a typically American, you know, optimist, we can fix everything. <laughs> but let's allow him some optimism, it's, it's a relief after all the gloom and doom. Um, what do we do with artificial intelligence? I'm not very concerned with this, to tell you the truth. I don't believe in artificial intelligence. I think that's a wrong, that's a wrong term. That's uh, like totalitarianism. It's a fake category. Um, 
I don't think that the machines have or will have or could have anything similar to what we call intelligence. Maybe they'll have something else, but we'll have to invent a new, a new category. Um, I do think that artificial intelligence is great fun, you know, in William Gibson or in uh, uh, a number of uh, Scottish writers and so on. So, um, narratively, I have nothing against it. As a real prophecy, I don't think so. I think our problems are, first of all, other people, secondly, animals, thirdly, plants. In other words, ecology. Not, not really... Uh, and the machines are what I said to in, in the previous answer. The machines are, first of all, today very often wrongly conceived, right? Either for oppressing people or for more militarily or for oppressing workers for more productivity, okay? Both of which we don't need. Productivity we have is enough and the military should be kicked out of our lives in general. Um, the, um, of course, who can be against technology? I would be dead without modern medicine by now. Okay? How can one be against technology in general? But I think one would have to say which technology, who is using it, for what purposes. Darko greetings. This is Helena. Long time Helena, no see. Helena greetings. Yeah, long time no see. I indeed. Um, uh huh. What is it? Two hundred years? <laughs> or am I looking into the future already? Um, I have a question that was posed to me, and that uh, Ralitza would actually like all of us to address. And in the course of this conference, I was consistently struck by the differences between certainly Russian sci-fi and Anglophone sci-fi. Um, a lot of the time, I do not think of Russian sci-fi as being, strictly speaking, sci-fi, just as the prohibition against philosophy in 19th century Russian universities made its literature very ideological. I think in Russian sci-fi, even with people like Strugatsky, I don't see them as actually being, strictly speaking, sci-fi writers, okay? So the question that I was asked to pose is, how did socialism influence sci-fi? And I'm sorry, when I speak uh, with a loudspeaker, I sound like a dumb blonde, okay? And I'm not only dark-haired, but I hope not too dumb. Uh, so, Darko? Uh, I, I didn't get these last. I, I got the <laughs> Don't question. worry about my uh, being uh, a dumb uh, blonde. Don't get fixated by being a dumb blonde. How did socialism influence sci-fi? Did it actually make Russian and East European sci-fi in some either unidentifiable or maybe in some clearly articulated way different from Western sci-fi. What do you think? Ah, well, um, one way to answer it would be, uh, you know, um, the old medieval quarrel about nominalism. Um, let's talk about Lehman, Strugatsky, and 10 other people and forget categories like Russian science fiction or whatever. Uh, and in a way, that would be very fruitful because we would be actually making work from inductively. Of course, we have to use some deductive categories to talk about anything, but we would be going through the text inductively as you do, as I do, and so on. Uh, however, I, I, do, I do think that there is identifiably something like Russian science fiction by the way, never say sci-fi to anybody in the science fiction community because it's that considers to be non-cool. 
I just say, oh, oh, wait a minute. But anyway. It's better um, than science fiction. For science fiction people, it's SF. But since one always says the F word, I'm trying to avoid that so as not to confuse it right, with the right, other I F see, word. Yes, yes, the American correctness. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I consider the so called socialism what the ruling parties call the, the really existing socialism, right? Uh, a field of forces. I don't consider it as one fixed ideology. Of course, there was an ideology, there was an ideology member of the Politburo, okay? But by, I don't know when, by about 1956 in Russia, nobody believed this in any, anymore, I think. Uh, except people who lived off it. So uh, let's forget this. Uh, it, it was a field of forces, um, as I think one of your papers, the Petrov one said, um, which had, to my mind, some liberatory uh, aspects, which were dominant, say, up to 1928, and then it had some stifling aspects, which became dominant after 1928, and which were partially repealed by the thaw, and so on and so on, and then recongealed, we know the story. So it depends if you mean, uh, if you mean the long duration Russian tradition is of course a tradition of building, a tradition of folk tale, fairy tale, which is very strong in the Strugatskis. Okay. Um, and it led them to theorize, to my mind, wrongly about their own work in science fiction in general. They just called it something like Fantastica. Uh, another reason was that Nauka was, of course, claimed by the ideologist Marxism was claimed to be a science, which I think is totally wrong. Okay, so when you said Nauka, you connoted Marxism. Uh, and by the way, you connoted official Marxism, which was a horror. Okay, so okay, I can understand the Strugatskis not wanting to use Nochnaya Fantastica, but I cannot quite approve it. I'm not ready to jettison the whole history of science because of its abuse. Okay, I'm not ready to jettison Bacon and the 19th century people, Pascal, uh, uh, 19th century people and so on. Um, so I would like to keep to keep the scientific if we can rephrase it uh, in in the Hesiodian sense that I propose to you that there is a science one and the science two and the science one is the original pursuit of wisdom and we, uh, articulated and 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 institutionalized pursuit of wisdom. Just not just anything. Um, so, if you are talking about how did the government influence it, this is very clear. It influenced it by censorship, by saying you can do this and you cannot do that, and I will give you a lot of money and and the dacha if you do this, and I will and you will get into trouble if you do that. Okay, that is the how should I say the repressive aspect of the socialism, real socialism. Then on the other hand, it introduced also the humanist elements, you know, the whole, I mean, Dobro Lyubov and Bielinsky and the whole 19th century Chernyshevsky, who was of course the mentor of Lenin and so on, were, were read, they were discussed. Uh, Dostoevsky was read unofficially, but he's also there, of course. The others were read officially, and you had this strong uh, Russian humanist, um, how should I say, current, um, which is based on pre-capitalist social situations, on direct contacts. I mean, you can see it very clearly in all the major novels of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and all their followers up to the Soviet ones. Uh, and that is a very, a very rich, very enriching influence which also existed under socialism. You cannot change 200 years of history 
uh, however oppressive you are, very quickly. By the way, capitalism is much better at changing history quickly than uh, these relatively technologically uh, old-fashioned systems were. So that would be my answer. I can't give you an answer, really. I can give you two answers. Do we have any other questions for Professor Sudi? Yeah, it is uh, Konstantin speaking, Konstantin Gurgiev. And I, I was wondering, uh, whenever we were framing this communism and science fiction discussion, I noticed that we kind of tend to think of how communism influenced science fiction. But actually yesterday we had this really fruitful discussion on how uh, children were taught certain things and certain ways of thinking about the future through science fiction and narratives about the uh, outer space and so on. Uh, and, and this is also what I believe we were trying to do, to see a kind of a dialectical connection between communism and science fiction, specifically in our case, through zones, but in as a not as a unilateral connection, but as something that goes both ways. And I was wondering, what is your take on that? How, uh, in the context of uh, these societies, actually science fiction managed to teach its readers certain things, say anything at all? I'm not sure I got it. How, in really existing communism, science fiction managed to teach uh, children? Well, not necessarily children, but what was science, fic science fiction's influence on uh, the socialist societies it was produced in? Influence on? On society and on communism, on ideology, on, on all broad topics existing. <laughs> well, I, I gave you a whole paper which tried to deconstruct the categories of science fiction and the category of communism. Now you are asking me how these two entities interact. Uh, I cannot answer this. I don't believe. I don't believe it's fruitful to talk about these entities as monolith. In other words, your question is too general for me to answer. Uh, if you gave me a particular question about how did this group of science fiction do that uh, to, to, to that group of population, I would, I would uh, try a hypothesis, but uh, the rest I cannot answer. Fair enough then, to, to make it as narrow as possible in the specific case of what we're trying to do, do you think that, for instance, the Strugatskis were not only influenced by certain uh, things in uh, their society when they're writing, but do you think how do you think that they uh, they influenced on on their part? How did Strugatsky's, the Strugatskis influence the the Russian readers? You mean? Yeah. Well, they were extremely popular. They managed to partly outwit, partly make a truce with the censorship. They were published in hundreds of thousands of copies. I don't know, you can find all of these data by now. Um, and they were a kind of breath of fresh air. First of all, uh, their language is wonderful. You know, all the people who read Russian know this. It's, it's uh, when you compare it to the, what the French call the langue de bois, the wooden language of official, uh, uh, state uh, pronouncements um, and uh, I don't know what we would call the official capitalist state pronouncement, I guess the plastic language. Well, it was neither wooden nor plastic. It was really a, a living language with, with idioms from everyday life and so on and so on. And then they had this fantastic uh, way of projecting the problems uh, uh, into a supposed other planet, other time, other space, which were really their young readers' problems. Um, I, I think they influenced it towards 
what I would call positive horizons towards openness, towards understanding. Um, they they had, I think, a problem. They had a little bit of a gender problem. I don't know how they would have influenced female readers. Uh, because uh, somebody mentioned here Maya Glukova. Glumova is not a very successful character. Um, and in general, it's more or less uh, science fiction for young males, uh, which doesn't mean it cannot be read by older males or by women. Of course it can, but it won't give them that much. Um, and and uh, um, so that particular slice of uh, Soviet youth, which after all was very important, which after all are the people who are now ruling Russia, was I think uh, influenced in, in very positive ways. And I, I try to say that, of course, it's a pity that they couldn't read all that to sign. And, and the Strugatskis got very gloomy at some point, you know, that gave you a bit, it's all this atmosphere, it's like today's television, all this dark, the rain is falling all the time, and so on. Uh, it's understandable that they got discouraged, they were human, you know. It's not, I think, very fruitful, but it's understandable. And some of the best things were, of course, not published at all. The satires where Stalin appears and so on. Um, but I would say they were, uh, with with a limitation that not not always the dominant elements in the Strugatskis are are science fictional. For example, Monday begins on Saturday, or how is it? Uh, it's uh, certainly more or less magical, updated fairy tale, you know. But in a sociological setting of young scientists, which is very interesting, okay, this, this contradiction is very interesting. Uh, but on the whole, I'm a great admirer of the Strugatskis. I'm only sorry we don't have them today in Russia, okay. Thank you very much. Let's give everyone Professor Suvin a hand of appreciation.